I believe some of you want to know who I am, but for those who don't, my name is Ioana Kakuli, and I'm the acting director of the Stavros Foundation Center for the Study of Hellenic Culture, and also a professor in the Department of Material Science and Engineering here at UCLA. Um, today's talk is proudly presented as part of our YEFIRA, the Bridge Program. As you may know, this is a collaborative initiative between our center and the equivalent Stavros Nyarkos Foundation Center for Hellenic Studies at Simon Fraser University, established with the generous support of the Stavros Nyarkos Foundation. The mission of YEFIRA is to connect students, faculty, and communities along the west coast of North America with scholars and artists from Greece and elsewhere, cultivating expansive and imaginative approaches to Greek culture and knowledge production. With that uh, context in mind, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce our esteemed speaker for today, Dr. Julia Tolke. Did I get that right? Perfect. <laughs> and currently serving as an assistant teaching professor at the Institute for the Liberal Arts at Imori University. <laughs> Julia has also made her mark as an adjunct professor in media and society at Hobart and William Smith Colleges. She earned her PhD in visual and cultural studies from the University of Rochester. Julia's groundbreaking project, Aesthetics of Crisis, meticulously documents political streets, art graffiti in Athens since 2013. Capturing nearly 7,000 photographs, this research offers a lens into how Athenian walls became a canvas for societal reactions from the Greek debt crisis to the COVID-19 pandemic. The project traces pivotal events, such as the 2015 austerity referendum, rising feminist and queer protest, anti-Airbnb movements, and the recent shift towards graffiti removal as a hopeful gesture towards post-crisis healing. Recognized for her in-depth analysis, Yulia was awarded in 2022 the Prosser Award by the International Visual Sociological Association. Today, we look forward to delving into her new book, Aesthetics of Crisis, Political Street Art and Graffiti in Athens between 2013 and 2023. Following the main presentation, Dr. Simon Zenos, the Associate Director of our Center, will moderate the Q&A segment. To conclude, I would like to express profound gratitude to all the members of the Stavros Nyarko Center who have worked tirelessly to ensure the success of today's event. And with this, please join me to welcome Dr. Julia Falke. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for this generous introduction and thank you all for being here. Let me just reset my timer here. Um, thank you all for being here on this lovely Saturday afternoon and joining us in this conversation about my work in Athens over the past 10 years. Um, I want to say just briefly at the outset that I am not a Hellenist. Uh, I'm an interdisciplinary scholar, as you heard, located between visual culture, anthropology, and urban studies. So as you can maybe uh, grasp here, street and graffiti is an excellent kind of intersection point for all these various disciplinary interests and leanings of mine. But I'm always very grateful and, um, and you know, inspired to be in conversation with people in modern Greek studies and beyond. As you'll see, my archive and my work really lives from being reactivated across different contexts, so I'm very excited to be here um, as part of the Yefira initiative, which also feels very closely aligned with my own uh, kind of investment in public humanities and interdisciplinary scholarship, so thank you. All right, so let me start. I first set foot in Athens in January 2013, and ever since that moment, ever since that first encounter, I have sought to make sense of the city, primarily by walking and taking photographs of its walls, which has been a process of attuning myself to the visual text and textures of the urban landscape, all this in a city that um, archaeologist, not archaeologist, architect and architectural historian, Horacis Pangalos once very aptly, I think, described as one of the most stained and saturated in the world. The, and this has been a kind of 
a phenomenological, psychogeographic mapping of the urban landscape that has taken its cues directly from the material landscape of the city. Unfolding with various intensities over a period of now more than 10 years, this process has, as you already heard, yielded an archive of nearly 7,000 images, all of which are made available open access online through the photo sharing platform Flickr, where they also are um, archived with full metadata and geolocation and free for anyone to use in their own work. Um, and this visual archive, these 7,000 nearly images are really at the core of my project, Aesthetics of Crisis, which began in 2013 as my master's thesis and research, but has since continued and evolved as a kind of more open-ended public humanities effort. And I invite you, if you're interested to read further, to visit this website, um, which gives you links and access to all the different data and materials that I've made available. The subject matter of these 7,000 photographs is largely street art and graffiti, specifically political street art and graffiti, a term that I use very broadly to refer to self-sanctioned interventions in the urban landscape. And for me, the political significance of these interventions is rooted less in what they are, their aesthetic properties or their intentional messages, although that occasionally is important, of course, but really their capacity to uh, to serve as a performative intervention, right? To actually change and reclaim space and change the meaning of space, right? So I'm interested in what they do, how they interact and interface with the urban landscape. And what they do is they appropriate space in the sense of a right to the city, right? The right of urban citizens to determine what their, um, their everyday landscapes look like. They contest and negotiate public ownership, meaning and belonging. And they also inscribe alternative voices and histories into the material landscape of the city. Something that I really want to emphasize is that I don't think of these interventions simply as artifacts of counterculture, some kind of authentic weapon of the weak or an authentic or monolithic um, voice from below as they are often perceived and theorized, but rather a complex, dialogic, polyphonic, always ongoing, always transforming process of meaning making. And the image that I brought in here to, um, to visualize that is, of course, uh, something that is very common for the landscape of Athens that I'm, I'm sure many of you are familiar with, right? You see at the ground a fascist symbol that has been overwritten by an anarchist sign, which has been crossed out, and it's framed by tags, and next to it is the insignia of Kukue, the Communist Party, right? So there's not just one voice or one message or one kind of authentic situation we find here, but a constant back and forth and negotiation over you know, the political meaning of the urban landscape. Embedded as they are in the flows of public space, which we can define as accessible to all and comprised of strangers as well as controlled but always open to subversion. What makes these works really meaningful and interesting and significant in my own understanding and my research is precisely that they don't have a static meaning but that their meaning is constantly produced, reproduced, transformed in the encounter between different elements. And these elements include, of course, the visual trace, right? The actual or the visual artifact, the trace left by an artist or an activist or a graffiti writer using particular aesthetic elements or discursive references to convey a particular message that may or may not be successfully conveyed by what we see on the wall. Then the actual site in which it takes place, right? The materiality of the the urban, the site-specific uh, materiality of the urban fabric and whatever historical meanings and layers of meaning are embedded in a particular space. And then, of course, the eyes of the urban dweller that encounters these works in their everyday um, their everyday urban life. So these kinds of elements are, um, the encounter between these elements is where meaning is produced, 
Um, and these are, of course, always filtered through the broader discursive aesthetic and spatial economies and discourses in which they are embedded. I've always thought of my photographs as ethnographic, as they are, of course, generated from my own embodied reflexive engagement with the body of the city. But it's only over time that I've really come to understand or arrived at my understanding of what is really a methodology, right? It's less a kind of subject matter to research, but it's a methodology. I photograph urban inscriptions and urban interventions not to produce artifacts for analysis, even though I do, of course, engage and analysis and visual, uh, visual analysis in particular, um, but in order to render visible and sensible gradual changes in the urban landscape over time. Uh, and my, my colleague, the architect Sabina Andron, has put this very succinctly, so I'll quote her here. She says, when you observe and photograph walls for a long time, they become portals into the evolution of a place at an intimate and uncoordinated level. I would maybe rather say intuitive rather than uncoordinated, but this really gets across how I think of this work of photographing the city. So through this lens, I've come to think of my archive of Athens, not, not simply as a kind of historical inventory of ephemeral artifacts, right? These are, after all, ephemeral um, artworks that may or may not disappear any given day, but rather as a corpus, a kind of living body that speaks in myriad ways to the shifting spatial politics and political ambiance of the Athenian terrain throughout a period of profound urgency and change. And that period is what I call the, um, the long 2010s, which is a period roughly bracketed by the 2008 financial crisis and the 2020 COVID pandemic. And it's a period during which Athens developed from an epicenter of crisis to a kind of romanticized New Berlin, right, a site of cultural fascination, to now in the most recent period, a site for projecting a kind of post-crisis narrative, a post-crisis creative city narrative, a return to normality. So this is kind of what I will do in my talk today to try to trace that trajectory through my archive and kind of give you a sense of how I think we can map these developments through the practice of street art and graffiti. In order to set us up, I want to start at the very beginning and share with you what actually led me to Athens. I'm from Germany, as you, uh, as I think was possibly said earlier, uh, from Berlin originally. So maybe it bears some explanation how I ended up in Greece photographing the walls. So, um, and here it's important to note that my first encounters with the Athenian streets and walls actually didn't happen on the ground with me walking around with a camera, but in mediation through crisis reporting on Greece in German and international media in the early 2010s. So in the early 2010s, I was a master's student in Berlin, and I also had this part-time job in a newspaper archive. So I was consuming a lot of daily newsprint and tracking the currents of crisis and protest that had been set in motion by the 2008 financial crisis. And of course, Greece in that story played a huge role, especially in the European context, right? Greece was already, when I started kind of noticing um, this, the, these media discourses, was already firmly established as Europe's epicenter of crisis, right? The epicenter of the economic crisis ongoing at the time. This is a German article, but you can probably infer that it says the epicenter of crisis there in the title, right? This is not a subtle discourse. This was clearly established. Um, and so Greece was, was featured in the news constantly. And if Greece was the epicenter of crisis, and I won't go into the kind of mechanics of the economic crisis here, though we can definitely get to that in the Q&A or reception if, if people would like to kind of return to that. Um, but if Greece was cast as the symbolic epicenter of crisis, then its capital Athens really came to serve as, the, as a proxy, a metonym, and a privileged site of observation for that crisis condition. So reporting on the Greek crisis at the time was really focused on macro dynamics. It was focused on you know, debt reduction, financial mechanics, political negotiations over crisis. Um, but 
the imagery that was chosen, the visual discourse that accompanied that um, was actually very much a kind of micro perspective that trained its eye on the Athenian crisis scape, as many came to call it, right? Training its eye on spectacular scenes of protest, of ruination, of urban precarity, right? All these different things that became visual shorthands for a crisis. So this is kind of um, how, how I saw this discourse unfold at the time. And of course, this is particularly meaningful because it's thrown into very sharp relief against the city's his classical histor or historical idealization as the cradle of Western civilization, the cradle of democracy, the cradle of Europe, right? To see this juxtaposition between the ancient ruins, which are of course much romanticized, and then the contemporary ruins of the crisis was what made this visual discourse so potent and so strong at the time. And one thing that I very quickly noticed as I was following this is that the images that I saw would very often feature street art and graffiti, right? And you can see a little tableau here with some examples. They would show slogans, they would show stencils, they would show mural works, sometimes in the background, sometimes in the focal point, but never contextualized, right? As I told you, the textual narratives were about macro dynamics, and these, these images were just meant to illustrate that they weren't at all kind of questioned or interrogated or put into context by the texts that they accompanied. They were mere illustrations, right? They would be captioned something like a mural in Athens as the top, um, top left one from my perspective there, um, navigating the storm engulfing Greek banks. So there was this heavy discrepancy between image and text, but these images to me spoke in ways that the text never did and never could to kind of everyday lived reality. Um, among living amid crisis. So I kind of started tracking and tracing these images and, um, and that's what eventually led me to come to Athens. I can't exactly tell you when this pivot happened from this kind of curiosity and frankly kind of frustration with the visual discourse because I was really interested in these images but nobody was telling me anything about them. Um, but I remember very vividly seeing a very particular image um, and finding myself very moved by it. And that image is this, uh, this piece by the artist WD, um, which is modeled, as I would later find out after a famous Diane Arbus photograph named uh, Boy, with, oh, Boy with Hand Grenade in, oh, there we go, uh, Boy with Hand Grenade in Central Park, right? You can see the, the kind of citation here very clearly. I didn't know that at the time though. And I don't have the original article for you, but just imagine seeing this image alongside a kind of business section article on debt reduction, right? And, and seeing this image. And I really felt deeply moved and deeply kind of punctured by the small details of this work, the way that the, the way that the Rent, that the lines of the simple illustration rendered visible a sense of urgency and tension, right? The tenseness of the body, the grimmest face, the kind of contorted hand, um, and, and I really kind of, and the way that all of that kind of merged with and mapped onto the graffitied wall underneath. So, so this image I remember really, really moved me and really the accumulation of moments like this is what led me to decide in 2013 without having any prior relationship with Athens other than this media discourse to go off and see what this was all about. So that's how we get to the beginning of this project. And the goal at this time, when I first came to Athens in 2013, was pretty straightforward. I wanted to examine political street art and graffiti in relation to the crisis, looking at it as both an artifact, right, a kind of outcome of the crisis, as well as a way of responding to the economic crisis ongoing at the time. And here I want to offer a brief caveat, which is that even though there is very broad agreement that the 2010s were an exceptional period, a significant period in the proliferation of graffiti and street art on the walls of the city, they're actually not 
Political graffiti, especially political wall writing and political posters, actually have a very long tradition in Greece and in Athens since at least the middle of the 20th century. Even though this history is not well documented at all, I'm waiting for a scholar to kind of pick that up and give us the ultimate kind of guide to historical political graffiti in Greece. But there are kind of traces. Um, for instance, there is a wonderful documentary by the filmmaker um, Alinda Di that traces women, women's involvement in resistance against both the, uh, the Nazi occupation and the military dictatorship. And in one of the interviews, one of the women, or several of the women actually talk about going out at night and painting slogans on the wall during the Nazi occupation, right? This was part and parcel of the resistance that young women, which were of course not quite as scrutinized when they would enter the streets, um, would would write kind of resistance slogans to claim the kind of ongoing presence of it in the city. And of course, there is also some documentation of political graffiti during the resistance against the military dictatorship. And here I'm showing you an image uh, that from the very famous Polytechnic uh, occupation in 2000. In, 1973, which is of course credited with inaugurating the fall of the military junta the year past. And you can see not just banners and slogans, but also graffitied inscriptions on the columns of the Polytechnic entrance gate, um, which by the way, recur often, right? So not only is there a history, but there is also citation of this history. As I told you earlier, I was in, um, I was in Athens during the COVID pandemic and during the first uh, COVID lockdowns, the first two, and Kato y Junta, down with the Junta, which is something that is written there, it's partially obscured, but on one of the columns, uh, reoccurred as a slogan during the COVID pandemic, right? So people cite from these historical lineages and these historical moments as they make sense of new experiences of, in this sense, a kind of perceived political repression during the COVID pandemic. Um, so this is something I want, to, want you to keep in mind. And I really want us to think about the contemporary landscape of Athenian street art and graffiti, not as something that only just emerges in a kind of historical bubble, but something that is really a, an amalgamation of different lineages and aesthetic traditions that brings together, among other things, this lineage of political posters and wall writing that is still extremely present in the streets of Athens, as well as references in, more, in a more general sense to Greek visual culture. Here I wanted to um, point your attention to an artist named uh, Stelios Faitakis, who sadly just passed away this week, um, but who was a pioneer of both graffiti and street art in Greece and who strategically incorporated Byzantine images and uh, you know, icon painting in his, in his visual repertoire to comment on contemporary issues of political struggle and strife. And then of course we have the more global aesthetics of graffiti and street art which come to Greece in the case of graffiti in the mid to late 80s and in the case of street art in the late 90s to early 2000s which is a more globalized aesthetic. So we have local and global and regional aesthetics kind of converging in the present, right? So it's neither exceptional nor a kind of, uh, you know, aesthetic of this moment only, but it, it borrows from and amalgamates different historical and visual traditions. All right, so what was specific and what was significant about the early 2010s is that there was a really intense proliferation um, that was tied to a set of material and social conditions that were very much specific to the economic crisis. First and foremost, a deregulation of the urban center, right? So the crisis um, came with the implementation of austerity, as you're all aware, I'm sure, um, meaning that there were budget cuts, uh, very heavy and sharp budget cuts uh, anywhere and everywhere in public government, including the municipality of Athens. So there simply wasn't money for things like graffiti cleanup or graffiti policing that was simply deprioritized in that historical moment, right? There were other issues to take care of. So other than some you know, good citizens, nobody was really taking care of removing anything from the walls of the city. 
And then you also have a, a sense of disinvestment, right, with businesses retreating from the urban center or simply, you know, going bankrupt um, and people taking out their investments into the urban center, which leads to a material transformation, right, this uh, crisis scape where you have a lot of abandoned spaces, empty storefronts, abandoned architectural projects that simply become new canvases for artists to um, appropriate. And there are a lot of artists who work specifically on, you know, like in that case, they're on boarded up windows, boarded up doors, that kind of, or, you know, shop windows, or these kinds of, uh, you know, abandoned architectures in the center. So there's a material transformation of the landscape that people then appropriate in their creative practice. And then the third kind of structural factor is that of crisis creativity, or what I call crisis creativity, which is a narrative, an idea that crisis serves as a catalyst of creativity, both in the sense of everyday survival, right? People having to find new ways of getting by and making do, but also in the sense of formal artistic and creative expression. And to underscore that point, I always like to bring in this quote by the artist Rafour from an interview I did with her in 2013. And she says, uh, I think very clearly here, and through all this crisis, I think we should all actually feel lucky because it makes us more creative. I was talking with another artist about that exactly yesterday. We are creative now because if we were in a period where everything is calm and nothing really happens, we wouldn't have the motivation to express ourselves. It's not a good situation to be in, I'm not saying that, but I think it makes you creative. And this was a pretty widely accepted kind of truism about the decade of crisis, um, that it conjured up a kind of exceptional sense of creativity, especially among young Greeks, which were, of course, especially, um, especially affected by the impact of crisis and austerity, you know, in terms of mass unemployment, in terms of, you know, the loss of perspective for the future and so forth. So these factors, the deregulation, disinvestment, crisis creativity, lead to a really dense saturation and layering of works on the walls of the city and a non-removal of these works, even in contexts such as this where you would think you know, things would be cleaned up pretty quickly, even on representative publicly owned infrastructures and buildings, as in this case on the National Academy on Panepistimio Avenue. I'm sure many of you recognize the building. This is what it looked like when I arrived for the first time in January 2013, and that's what it still looked like when I left four months later. Nothing changed. So this was, this was what the city looked like at the time. So we have a kind of elongated lifespan of these artworks, and because they're allowed to stay up for longer than usual, in other places on the walls of the city. Um, we also get kind of dialogues to unfold on the walls of the city. This is a kind of self-contained example, but I, I really like it, so I always like to bring it in for the, the matter of dialogue, right? Every movement is political, not always. So there's, there's an active kind of back and forth. So I think, and I'm not the only one, um, I think it's very legitimate to think of the walls of Athens during those years as a living archive of the crisis, an archive that is polyphonic, that is responsive to daily events, but also that generates its own aesthetics um, in response to the broader discursive context of the crisis. Of course, not everybody engages with this in the same way, and people have very ambivalent responses to the presence of graffiti in their city. But as anthropologist Pausanias Karathanasis has said, I think very poetically, it does create a very specific situation in which you can never be estranged from the social political processes of the city and the country. Whether you want to engage or not, whether you want to actually read the graffiti and think about why somebody would write that or whether you just consider it all a kind of de degradation of the fabric, you can't escape it, right? That's how omnipresent graffiti and street art are in this particular moment in time. <laughs> 
So then let me tell you a couple of the things that I found on the walls in the early years of my research um, and how I kind of thought about them in relation to the crisis. So I found in mapping what I found on the walls of the city, I found different aesthetic clusters, one of which was uh, political slogans, stencils, and posters that respond really directly to the crisis and actually articulate a critique of the crisis through the very actors and protagonists of it on the kind of global stage, right? The EU, uh, Angela Merkel, of course, Germany has, uh, Germany and Greece had a very particular relationship uh, during those years of crisis. And I am German, I'm happy to talk in the Q&A or later about how that has kind of impacted my own, my own engagement and presence in the city. But you can see here, these are very direct responses that pick up on discourses of debt, of uh, the Euro, of the so-called Brexit and so forth. So um, this is one aesthetic clusters that I found on the walls. Another is um, artworks that kind of reference and create almost monuments to the politicized atmosphere of the city at the time. So in the early years of the crisis, there was, as I'm sure many of you are aware, a very strong and very present anti-austerity movement. So people were really strongly responding to and resisting the mandate of austerity, the public spending cuts, and what they did to the kind of social and cultural fabric of the country. So for many years, um, there were you know, hundreds of demonstrations a month, you know, there was just huge mass strikes, mass or general strikes, mass demonstrations. There was an occupation of Sintama Square, right? This was omnipresent in those early years, the kind of politicization of the urban fabric. And these artworks uh, kind of cite some of the icons of that struggle, gas masks, Molotov cocktails, and kind of, you know, create little monuments in the urban landscape to that politicization and keep it present in everyday life. And then what was probably most meaningful to me are works is another aesthetic cluster that contains what I would call expressively figurative works that speak to the embodied everyday and lived reality of crisis and austerity. So these are works that depict from or depart, excuse me, depart from depictions of the crisis as an abstract and disembodied economic, financial, political process and really look towards or, or try to bring out an understanding of it as a deeply felt corporeal lived experience, right? As in these cases, right? Referencing things like health, referencing things like health, referencing things like hunger, right? Really pulling our attention away from the broader macro dynamics towards the felt micro impact of the crisis. These works very often deploy the human body as a site of display for the affective experience of crisis, including the precaritization um, that was, or precarization that was common at the time, um, the kind of impoverishment of, of, of the Greek population, um, the sense of disorientation and suspension. The British anthropologist Daniel Knight has, I think, very evocatively described the experience of crisis as one of vertigo, right? One of feeling yourself kind of, you know, disoriented, kind of losing your footing, not knowing where to go next, right? And I feel that's a very, that's something that I saw depicted in the walls of the city as well, right? In these depictions that, um, you know, dwell on things like, you know, fragmentation or, or dissolution of, of kind of our known, known truths about what's going on, right? Disorientation, suspension, fragmentation. Then there are also a lot of works that speak to a damaged sense of time, right? A scrambling of linear trajectories of past, present, and future, a suspension of the future that is very often mapped onto depictions of children, as in this case, uh, one of my favorite works actually by the um, artist Dimitris Taxis, which is literally titled, I wish you could learn something useful from the past. So these are kind of the initial aesthetic clusters that I found when I went in 2013, but ever, ever since I've 
continued this work, and I'll skip this bit actually, um, I have written about different ways in which narratives of crisis are contested and subverted on the walls of Athens, including, for instance, playful deconstructions of the specter of antiquity that, of course, always already overdetermines how people think about the Greek pa uh, present, right? That kind of omnipresent um, framework, as well as, for instance, the strategic use of the English language. I'm sure you've all noticed that a lot of the works that I've shown use English or other languages, in my understanding, in a strategic way to participate in international media discourses. Artists are very well aware that their works might end up on a press photo and in a German newspaper um, newspaper, and in front of my eyes as a result of that. So they actively participate in these dialogues by using the English language or other languages um, that are legible to international press photographers and journalists. I've also written and thought about how the walls have directly responded to specific political events and sometimes foreshadowed different political events. So one aspect of that would be the response to the 2015 austerity referendum in which the walls actually prefigured the vote uh, that came out of it in the end, right? There was a, a referendum over the th then third round of austerity um, that was uh, being negotiated at the time all the TV news would have you believe that the vote would definitely be a yes on austerity because otherwise everything's going to fall apart. The streets spoke a very different language and said no all around and that's what the vote ended up being in the end. So we have a very clear way in which the streets kind of prefigured what ended up happening here. Um, I've also, for instance, looked at the emergence of feminist graffiti and street art more and more since 2015. This was feminist messages and feminist works were extremely uncommon, extremely marginalized when I first started coming to Athens, but started to really forcefully appear around 2015. Um, and again, this is actually a prefiguration because Greece, as many of you may be familiar, did not actually have its quote unquote Me Too moment and movement until 2020, right? So that's how recently questions of um, abuse, femicide, gendered violence have really actually made it onto the political mainstream discussion in Greece, whereas the streets of Athens have been making them visible and claiming space for them since at least 2015 and with increasing intensity since then. So that's one of one other current that I've traced. And of course, I was also there during the uh, COVID pandemic, so I was also able to trace how, how that response played out in the street to that, to that new crisis in 2020. And I'm happy to speak more to any of these different currents and clusters in the q and or informally later at the reception, but for the remainder of my time, I want to focus on something different. I want to focus on how the material presence of street art and graffiti has been discursively and symbolically mobilized and how people have thought about and talked about Athens during this period of the 2010s. And that process has unfolded roughly in three phases. The first phase is that during which Athens and Greece are unequivocally the epicenter of crisis, as I already developed earlier. And that actually starts around 2008, 2009, and we can talk about the kind of bracketing of these moments uh, if you like. These are not hard, hard kind of boundaries, but just rough periodizations from my perspective. Um, so this is the first phase, and I begin to observe this in 2013, so keep that in mind. I, I came a little late. Um, but this is a time of intense and spontaneous proliferation and turnover on the walls of the city, during which two main discourses emerge. 
The first comes from the kind of mainstream political and media sphere where graffiti is posited as a symptom and really a pathology of crisis, something that indexes the collapse of the city, as you can imagine. I mean, um, it's, it's, um, you can imagine that this discourse would come about, um, a discourse of collapse and something, of course, that needs to be contained. And this approach, this, um, this perspective is very explicitly articulated by Amalia Zepu in 2014 when she offers a quote to the New York Times, absence of graffiti, the crisis is over, right? Very clearly articulated. Amalia Zepu, by the way, is an Athens deputy mayor for civil society and innovation, I believe is the title at the time. She's a trained anthropologist and this is a very famous quote now. The second discourse is very different. So for, and this is really a discourse that is mostly um, advanced by local artists, activists, and scholars that are engaging with the Athenian crisis scape. And they too see a collapse, but they interpret it very differently, right? They see collapse as a sense of possibility, right? The collapse is a collapse of systems, right? Systems that maybe never served people all that well, right? It's a collapse of capitalism and you know urban governance as we know it. So for a lot of people, this is actually a moment of possibility, right? A moment in which the city may become as, um, Mirto um, Tsilimpunidhi and Elwyn Walsh um, phrase it a passage to radical openness, right? An opening up of new possibilities of rethinking and reorganizing how we do things, how the city functions. And graffiti for this becomes an emblem of that, right? An emblem of possibility, an emblem of the potential rethinking that is also aligned with a broader political momentum underway of grassroots solidarity and other kinds of developments and new strategies that people are devising at the time. So these are the two initial responses to the presence of graffiti in phase one epicenter. Then that brings us to phase two, the new Berlin. So this is roughly, I would say, a phase that starts around the middle of the decade in 2015. It's a time when the crisis is still urgent and ongoing, but it's become pretty chronic, right? Pretty, people are pretty used to it. And it's also become overlaid with new crisis situations, the so-called refugee crisis and other new kind of um, you know, moments of urgency. So it's, it's still an urgent time, um, but not quite to the same extent that uh, it was in that first phase. And this is a time during which, especially in the international media ecosystem and also international scholarship, develops a real cultural fascination with the city of Athens, right, as this site of exceptional crisis creativity, right? People look at what has happened in Athens over the first half of the decade and they're really fascinated, including by the graffiti and street art, right? That's, that's part of it. But also the grassroots solidarity, all the other kinds of uh, protest movements that have come about. So people really start rethinking Athens as a fascinating, interesting place, a place that's good to think with. And the slogan, Athens is the new Berlin, which is here subverted by um, a Greek graffiti writer or a street artist, but was originally actually coined by a New York Times travel, um, travel piece in the New York Times Magazine in 2007, but took on new meaning in, um, in the context of the crisis, uh, is, is really emblematic of that. So Athens is a site of fascination and becomes repositioned as a site of alternative tourism. So people start coming to Athens to see this cool city. Uh, expats start moving to the city, especially artists start moving to the city. So it's really a repositioning of the meaning of this crisis city from epicenter to a kind of interesting, fascinating site. And graffiti and street art are deeply implicated in this. So during this time, you start getting more and more of these articles that I would really describe as clickbait that um, use street art and graffiti to supposedly offer some kind of authentic insight into what's going on in Greece, right? You just need to look at 19 pieces of Athens graffiti that perfectly sum up the attitude of young Greeks, right? These kinds of things start really, really peaking around that time. They already existed a little bit earlier as well, but 
they, they become really dense around this time um, and are of course really flattening and fetishizing um, this, this framework. Um, then you get also a lot of graffiti tourism. So that means essentially international artists flocking to Athens because they've heard it's a place where you can paint freely um, and coming and in many cases actually leaving commentaries on the crisis. So you see two examples here by an Italian and a French artist. So they come to Athens for a weekend or a week and you know they, they leave their commentary. Funnily enough, a lot of these works ended up featured in these kinds of articles. So there's, there's some irony in that as well, right? Um, learn what Greeks really think by looking at what a French guy painted over a weekend away in Athens, right? That's the kind of vibe we're getting here. And then there's also beginning an intense co-optation of graffiti and street art into this new alternative tourism model. So you get things like street art and graffiti tours, graffiti hostels, graffiti boutique apartments. I just took this photo um, in, in the beginning of this year. Of course, it says no tagging on the side of it, which, which makes it all the more kind of juicy, but um, these things exist now very abundantly in Athens, but they start in that period of cultural fascination with Greece. So it becomes a kind of marketable commodity. And artists respond to this in various different ways. Uh, one way of re response is to actually retreat. The artist WD, whose work I have featured here uh, quite a bit in this um, presentation, who is one of the most prolific artists uh, still to this day on the streets of Athens, he talks about about noticing that street art is being used as a means of gentrification and stopping to paint in the center as a result of that since 2015. That's actually what a lot of artists have done because they simply don't want to be co-opted into either the graffiti tourism or the clickbaity articles or the co-optations, right? They're just trying to kind of step away. And on the other hand, you also do get active resistance against it. So there's since around 2018, more and more, and anti gentrification, anti-touristification, and anti-Airbnb. Airbnb is, of course, the kind of emblem of gentrification here and touristification uh, pieces in the center, mostly graffiti, um, graffiti slogans and stencils that are directly addressing visitors to the city to not um, to kind of try to persuade them not to participate in this development, right? You see here a couple of direct address um, pieces of direct address, right? Dear tourists, enjoy your Airbnb, a future homeless Athenian, don't take photos, Exarchia is not a museum. So there's a real concern with the city potentially becoming Mu like made into a museum, right? A museum of crisis, a static landscape for consumption, and graffiti being a kind of souvenir for that, right? Being flattened into a kind of souvenir of a touristified city and thereby hollowed out of its political capacity to actually change public space and intervene in public space. All right, that brings me to the final phase, which is what we have now, um, which is what I call here the new normal, which is a phase that begins in 2019 with the election of a conservative establishment government at both the municipal and the federal level, level new democracy, um, both of which, both these governments are very invested in claiming that we are past the crisis and that we are now entering a new normal uh, um, a kind of new age where, where we can leave the kind of crisis behind us. And that strangely and, and interestingly has only been minorly complicated by the arrival of the COVID pandemic. You would think that the arrival of a health global health emergency actually complicates the idea that we're done with crisis. And there was definitely a lot of criticism of how um, the Greek government handled the COVID pandemic that was expressed as everything always is in the streets of the city that I documented at the time. But globally, Greece is not seen as an epicenter of this particular crisis, but it's actually seen as a success story. And I'm sure many of you have seen articles to this effect, right? Like this piece from the New York Times, it really says, oh, Greece actually did very well because Greece actually, in comparison to other places, did not suffer as many fat fatalities from COVID uh, and thus was kind of marketed and understood internationally as a success story. So it fits very well with the return to normal and the end of crisis. 
And in the streets of Athens, this return to normal is very clearly articulated through gra uh, graf graffiti and street art. So we have a new bifurcated strategy. On the one hand, there is a reinvestment in graffiti removal as a mode of reasserting control over the center and kind of reversing this collapse of the center. And then commission, commission murals as a, a, a targeted strategy of ur urban revitalization. So there's a dual investment in graffiti removal and commissioned art um, in, the, in the form of murals on the walls of the city, which together, of course, signify the end of crisis, as that quote by Amalia Zepu that I, I showed you not, not too long ago actually said very clearly. And the way this is presented is quite interesting. It's very performative. Um, you see these high profile campaigns like the Adopt Your City program, um, as well as uh, social media posts that really boast of the successes of this program by showing us always these before and after visuals, right? So like there in the corner or like here in, um, in some screenshotted posts from Mayor Vakoyanis' uh, social media accounts, you get this very clear sense of a before and after, right? Before it's dirty and, and full of graffiti, and then we clean it up and now it's taken care of. And Athens is a clean city again, we can return it to the citizens and everything will be great. And of course, when you look at the actual streets, right, it's not that easy. So um, this is, these are some photographs I took after a very fresh um, graffiti buffing campaign, so painting over campaign on Patision Street in downtown Athens. And you can see even while it's still fresh and it hasn't been painted over yet, there are um, these really hard edges, right? They don't even paint beyond the front facing bit of the street, right? So it's not actually about getting rid of graffiti. I think everybody knows that they're not going to get rid of graffiti. It's about the symbolic declaration of dealing with graffiti and what it signifies that, that these campaigns are really geared at. And this uh, kind of complication of the before and after, right? The presentations like this want to give us a very clear sense that there's a clear before and after of crisis. The streets tell us it's a little bit more complicated. Uh, that is very beautifully kind of signified by this one corner in Exarchia here, um, which is a corner that is very quintessentially Athenian, right? All of you who have familiarity with the urban center are, are going to recognize this as pretty quintessential, an urban parking void enclosed by these blind facades that have in this case for many, many years always been covered in graffiti um, and different forms of writing. Um, and this is actually the kind of image I show to people to convey just how normalized the presence of graffiti in, in the Athenian center is. So you can imagine that I found myself pretty sh that I found myself pretty you know surprised and shocked when I walked by the same wall in the summer of 2022 and found it completely overpainted by this new mural, which I would later found out was made by an Australian artist commissioned by the Australian Embassy and the city of Athens. And you can see he's trying to pay homage to Exarchia's history as a site of bookmaking and publishing and bookbinding. He's showing us these two old bookbinders um, exercising their craft. But to me, this signifies the way that um, this current policy is you know, co-opting the form of art in public space to actually silence the dialogue on that you know, graffiti and street art that actually makes graffiti and street art meaningful, right? So on the one hand, we have the kind of old uh, state of the space um, in which it is you know, painted on uh, by various voices. It's very chaotic. It's very emblematic of Exarchia, which is, of course, the central neighborhood that is known as the anarchist stronghold and you know, the kind of center of left counterculture in the city. And here we get a very simplified and tamed and aestheticized image of the same neighborhood projected back through a large scale mural that can't be questioned or uh, intervened upon the same way that these other works can, right? So the scale of the work really gives us one voice, one image of the city, one aspirational image of the city. But of course, there is a commissioned art piece, but there's also still graffiti all around the bottom, right? So 
things are not kind of sharp cut in the same way that the government is trying to position it or perform it, right? There's not, now there's graffiti and now there's commissioned art and one is crisis and one is the after of crisis, but rather those things coexist, continue to coexist and through them we see struggles play out over public space, over the future of the city and so forth. And so this is really where I want to bring us back to where I started, which is the idea of my archive as a method, right? The archive is a method to think about how looking not through one individual image or even a small set of individual images um, can reveal just something about a particular moment in time and what is going on in that particular moment in time. But having an archive of 7,000 images kind of resists these simple narratives about the city, right? The epicenter narrative, the New Berlin narrative, the post-crisis narrative, right? All of these cannot be easily found in an archive of 7,000 images. So that's really what to me is the broader intervention and the broader function of this archive. And it attains new meaning by living in the open, by being open access and by being constantly reactivated and reinterpreted by others. So I'm happy to now invite you into this process and into a dialogue about the sliver of the archive that I presented you today. Um, and, and I look forward to hearing what it conjured for you in response. Thank you.